Um, I'd like to introduce Don. He's uh, come to us through our ham radio networks. Um, and one of the big important parts of the radio spectrum is, is that it's got to be allocated from somewhere, which is where Don will introduce us to. Um, there's really two aims that we have with the kits, is, is that the kits are really designed to use the 27 megahertz ISM band, but there's a lot of hams who want to use it for every other ham band on HF. So um, there's more than just the ISM bands out there, and so this is why we wanted to cover, cover some of these issues. OK, I'll hand it over to Don. OK. Thanks, Kim. I don't know what your background is. I don't know whether you're radio hams and know everything about Spectrum or you're, you're, uh, you're Linux people and you're wondering what on earth this radio Spectrum stuff is and why do they make a fuss about it. So please excuse me if some of the stuff sounds like, like revision. Um, it may not be. Um, and this is ad hoc, password. I'll fix that. Sorry. <laughs> Okay, I'll just go, go back up to the first slide. Just who am I? Don Wallace, ZL2TLL. For those that aren't radio hams, that means I'm a radio amateur in New Zealand with a call sign Zulu Lima to Tango Lima Lima. The other bits I'll talk about in a moment, which is the NZARTALO, what that actually means. Okay, so we press the button on here and we have radio spectrum. First of all, just what are the various radio bands called? You hear about HF, you might hear about MF, broadcast band, broadcast AM broadcast band, up here, VHF broadcast band. This is the way in which around the world they actually classify the bands. Each is, a, is 10 times 30 kilohertz, 300 kilohertz and so on and so forth. What's the most important thing on the slide? The bit down the bottom. What does that mean? Radio spectrum, it's like land. You can't create any more of it. You can make better use of it but you can't create any more of it. So you've got to work out how you share it out. Just some parallels between land and spectrum. First of all, you think about the area of land. How big is your, you know, in, in New Zealand we, we would say our section, I think in Australia you call it a plot, is that right? How big is the, the plot of land that your, your building's on? Or how much bandwidth do you have in radio frequency terms? What's the capacity, how big is it? Um, if you have land, you can lease land or you can buy land. With radio spectrum, you can't buy spectrum. The spectrum is owned by, in New Zealand, the Crown. Australia, I suppose you'd call it the Crown as well. In other words, by the government, the Commonwealth or whatever. You can lease it off them. And when you lease it off them, you have a radio licence. Also, a few other things. A sports field. You think about a sports field, there are rules on a sports field as to what you're actually able to do on that sports field. It's not a free-for-all, it's, a, it's a, a soccer field or it's a rugby field or it's Australian rules or one of those. So there's a whole set of rules you've got to follow as, as to what you do when you're using that sports field. And an amateur radio band is a bit like that. It's some spectrum, some land that's being given to the amateurs, but there are various rules about how you use it, what power you're allowed to use. You know? And the fact you're not allowed to, to um, um, send the, the, the cricket balls into the, the neighbour's place or things like that. Okay. And there's another thing called a public playground, where you can do whatever you like. Um, I think actually you, in, in the Linux side of things, you talk about commons, common software, etc. There are no rules at all, basically. And that's called an ISM band, Industrial, Scientific and Medical Band. And what is an ISM band? It's used by RF welders, you know those plastic raincoats you can get that have got nice welded seams? The welders that weld the plastic? There are RF welders, microwave ovens, cordless phones, and Wi-Fi, all playing in the same public playground. Now you may say that doesn't make much sense. I mean, Wi-Fi is really important. Why is it there? Why is it there? Because people like Cisco, or the, people, the, the companies that Cisco bought in the States, said, we don't want to pay the federal government for radio licenses. So we're going to use a part of the spectrum that you don't have to buy licenses for. They call it license-free, which isn't quite correct. But basically, you don't have to buy licenses. It's free, and therefore, they use the ISM band. That's why, when you have a look at home, you'll find that your, um, your uh, cordless phone, for example, or your, your uh, router, your wireless router says, do not put this by the microwave. 
don't put don't put your wireless router by your cordless phone because they're all sharing the same spectrum and interference can result. Okay, we're now going to talk about where do these bands come from. Starting at the very top, an organisation called the ITU. It was founded way back in 1865. It's part of the United Nations. It's located in Geneva. Um, and part of the ITU, the radio communications part of the, the ITU, the ITU-R, is... Sorry? 1865, yeah. Back in the days of telegraphy, you know, and all that kind of stuff. Um, the radio communications part is the one that sets up the, what people tend to think of as rules, they're called the international radio regulations, but they're in fact a treaty between companies, countries, Agre agreement between countries that we are going to use this bit of spectrum for this purpose, this bit of spectrum for broadcasting, this bit for um, amateurs, we're going to use this bit over here for, for marine, and so on and so forth. The overall rules for the, for the system. In fact, there's things called the, radio, the international radio regulations, and I wasn't tra travelling on a cheap fare, I would have brought them with me. There's, they're A5 size books, they're about standard A5 and about that thick full of the regulation saying what, what, what happens. WRC, World Radio Conference 2015, is coming up at the end of this year. Every four years they look at the rules and say, oh, in fact every, every year recently they look at the rules and they say, oh, we need more for, for, for cellular, oh, we need more for cellular. You've, in New Zealand and in Australia, we've both gone to digital television, why? To, to, spare, to, to, to spare, spare up some space for cellular. Um, there will be 3,000 plus delegates there. I was at the last one on behalf of the, the, the organisation in New Zealand. Um, 150 different countries represented. And in some of the, some of the meetings called the, the oh, I've forgotten the name now, but anyway, you all get together, the plenaries, and there are 3,000 delegates in the hall. Don't get long to speak. Okay, why is it important? Well, New Zealand or Australian inf interests um, from the point of view of economic development. Because the kind of kit that we use, take Wi-Fi kit for example, if it wasn't standardised, certainly in New Zealand, if we had a New Zealand special one, I mean what manufacturer is, worth, is, is going to be interested in, in manufacturing kit for just the New Zealand market? Or just the Australian market even for that, that, that matter? We tend to take standards from elsewhere. Okay, we might develop things, but it's the big markets that people are going to manufacture kit for. Also, if you're out in your, uh, on your, in your yacht going around the world, it might be quite useful for the emergency frequency to be the same in every country. So you don't have to tune to a different frequency here and a different one here and so on and so forth. So that's the interoperability side of things. Um, but also, my interest is from an amateur radio side of things, and we are looking at, can we get some new bands? Somebody asked me before, when are you, get, when are you going to get the 60 metre band for us, 5 megahertz? We're working on trying to get an allocation at 5 megahertz. There's a lot of other, at the moment it's allocated to, to mobile and fixed, primarily, mo, primarily used by mobile. In New Zealand we've got support from our, our, our regulator for getting an allocation, albeit it's, it's limited support. In Australia I understand there's no support at all because apparently it's used for the flying doctor service or something like that or, or some other rural service. So, and around the world you've got a kind of get an agreement as to, as to whether you've got it or haven't got it so you know whether you can talk to people or you can't. And also, and this is, this is a very important thing, one of the things you may not realise is that all of those bands I showed you before, they were all allocated to radio amateurs originally. Because they weren't any use for anything else, people thought. And as technology comes along, new technologies, then OK amateurs, you had a, a bit of time to play with it, you, we'll give you a small segment of it to keep playing in, and we've been very fortunate, we've got small segments right the way through the spectrum, but we're going to use, it, use the major part of it for a more useful, um, something which is seen as being more useful. The amateurs don't necessarily see it that way. And an example of that is at 70, 75 gigahertz, there is a band at the moment which is exclusively allocated to radio amateurs, and it is likely we will lose part of that because it's, it's actually, it actually wanted for vehicle collision radar. So... You know, there's all these demands that come in, and it's a matter of sharing out that spectrum. 
Okay, Asia Pacific Telecommunity, what does that mean? That's the next level down. There are various regional groupings that get together, and if they can agree on a position, you know, if for example we could persuade APT to agree that, that having a 5 megahertz allocation of this particular type is a good idea, then basically all the votes of all of those countries, not that there's ever any voting, because we never do that when we do treaties, we always just talk about it and reach agreement, um, all, of that, all, of those country, all of those countries support a particular position, and that's where APT comes in. Um, APG 15.4 is about to be held in Bangkok. The previous one was, was in Brisbane, APG 15.3, and it's where all of the countries in the Asia-Pacific region get together and say, we think this should be done, we think that should be done. And remember that we're talking about all the radio, all the, all the items that are being thought about at the World Radio Conference, trying to form a common view on that. And then the New Zealand perspective. In New Zealand, we have an organisation called MB, Ministry of Business, Innovation and Employment. It's one of those great big ministries that we, for some reason, have, have made over here. Within that, there's something called Radio Spectrum Management, and that's Radio Spectrum Management are the, the people who actually set the policy. But we're fortunate in that we've got a committee, and I'm, you may have the same system in Australia, I don't know, but in New Zealand we have a thing called the Radio Sector Committee. Industry, amateurs government, etc., get together and have a bit of a discussion and say, yeah, well, we'll actually we'll support 5 megahertz for amateurs, agenda item 1.4 as they call it. But, we, but we're a bit concerned that, that it may cause interference over here, so we, might only, we won't, might only support it in this particular way and so on and so forth. So all, all of the industry gets together and works on these things. In the same way, we can monitor other parts of the industry may say, yes, we definitely want 75 gigahertz for vehicle radar. Yeah, but what about the amateurs? So we can reach a, an agreement, a, a position. Um, it's a conference preparatory con committee, is, is a CPG, lots of, lots of acronyms. CPG gets together and, and we end up with a document which is taken by the team to the next meeting of APT and then eventually at the end of this year off to Geneva to actually work out the nitty gritty of what's going to happen and what's going to go in the regulations. Um, Geneva is interesting, uh, as I say I was there last time. And we had the Russians there who said, we do not like the radio amateurs, they, ne they never do things right, do you know? Uh, I'm not quite sure what accent that is, but still. Um, and, and then you have other people, some, some other, other countries who are, who are against amateur radio in principle. And you have to kind of separate out the things from, is amateur radio, are you arguing about whether amateur radio should exist? So, and if you are, let's forget about that because it's, it's in the ITU regulations that amateur radio exists. Let's actually argue about whether, as in the last conference, there should be an allocation at 500 kilohertz to amateurs or not. And in fact, we did end up with an allocation at 476 kilohertz, I think it is, um, to amateurs. And then the amateurs in New Zealand, NZART by the way, is the New Zealand Association of Radio Transmitters, the equivalent in Australia is the Wireless Institute of Australia, the HAM group. The ALO, the Administration Liaison Officer, which is what I am, has the job of representing the amateurs to the government. So my job, well, there's two ways of looking at it. Really, I'm there to be blamed if we lose any amateur bands. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so that's 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 my role is is to, to to act as that interface between the amateurs and the and the government. And what is what's NZART? You can see that the objects of NZART: maintenance and expansion of the amateur service in New Zealand probably pretty similar to what the objects of the WIA are as well. And my job, I'm appointed by the council, so I can be fired by the council of, of the organisation. Um, working with the administration, other national and international groups. That's important because, you know, if you've got a group that is, let's take five megahertz, there's a particular group in New Zealand that uses five megahertz. Talking to them, I'm saying, well, what kind of is acceptable to you so that we can come up with a position that the, the regulator is going to put forward on behalf of New Zealand. There's no point in just going bald-headed into things and saying, right, right, we want all of it, please, and the other people say, well, actually, no, we're using it at the moment, so go away. Um, and there's also a linkage, of course, back to a, a thing called the IARU, the International Amateur Radio Union, which is the, the group that represents all of the amateur societies throughout the world. 
and we all work with that to, to form international positions which then come back down again into the various countries and we try and persuade our administrations to support the positions. And I think, oh, the role. This, this is the, the formal one. Oh, this is what happens when you take something out of, out of Windows and put it into, into Linux. But the formal one is you've got the members. We've then got council who decide what, to, what the, the members want. They then come to me. I then go to the ministry. But I, the way I like to look at it, look at it actually is in the next one, which probably has the same mess behind it, basically a funnel. And you'll notice that the funnel comes like this. There should actually be one in the middle, but you can see these things turn around. They're not, they're not just pretty corus, which you may have heard of your visitors from Australia, but they also say that sometimes it doesn't actually get through. And, you know, it's reality. You're negotiating. You're negotiating a, a, a position to try and get the best deal you can for the radio amateurs. Questions? Kim? Over to you. Oh, sorry, question at the back. You have. Can you repeat the question? Oh, sorry. You, you're asking the question, why, when, when can we have a six-metre band now analogue television is gone? Um, the answer is we have got back the six-metre band in New Zealand. It's on a, it's on a, uh, a temporary, you can have a permit. Ah, okay. Sorry. What you, what you, okay, the question is about when are we going to have a proper six-metre band in New Zealand as distinct from the, the arrangement we've got at the moment, basically. And the answer to that is, is very simple. What, what actually happened was that television licences in New Zealand were granted by the Crown to various television transmitters. To do that, they set up a particular mechanism which they put all the television frequencies in, or particularly the, low, the, the VHF ones, and then said, OK, you can have this frequency, you can have that frequency, you can have this frequency. That particular arrangement hasn't expired yet. It expires later this year. When it expires later this year, it just becomes spectrum like any other spectrum and can become a proper amateur licence. The reason why it causes amateurs a little bit of a problem in New Zealand at the moment is that most of our bands, we have a limit on transmitter power of 1,000 watts, um, 1, watts transmitter power. PEP. On this particular segment of the 6 metre band, because it's 4 megahertz wide, the, the 50 to 51 megahertz seg segment, it's one kilowatt EIRP, effective incident radiated power, which the difference between the two is that if you've got an an a, 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 a big antenna, you can increase your, your effective power. So for this particular segment, you can't use big antennas at the moment, but come later this year, the, the old mechanism will disappear and the new mechanism will be there. The, the thing to remember is that we could have actually not been given access to the segment at all until later this year. But they said, no, you can have access to the segment provided you obey these rules in the meantime. And you have, we have to obey the rules. They have to be set up that way because the way the licence is crafted, the way power is measured is as effective instant radia um, radiated power, which basically means the power that, that you standing in front of the antenna will be radiated with and your internal organs will get warm with, etc. Um, so that's, that's, that's the reason for that. The other thing too is, um, with what you're wearing here now, um, I ran it for a month, it was last year, uh, uh, 700 or 698 megs through to 800 gigs. The transmitters for um, wireless microphones oh, yeah. are, now, are now illegal to be used because they've given that for um, G3. Data. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's awesome. and that's 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 what happens over time. Sorry, there's some. Um, so just two questions. Uh, first, is how do you how do you get the least amount of data possible out of the one thousand kilowatt rating? Oh, sorry, restriction on power because it seems like a lot to me. I can imagine causing interference across a number of services. Okay. Yep. Yep. The the question was, the, given given that the these these terrible radio hams, you're not a radio ham, are you? Because, of course, you know, radio hams always are well behaved. They always follow all of the rules. They're not, they're not like Linux people, you know. You're not, not at all, not at all. Anyway, I mean, how is that, how is that police? Well, I, 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 probably the best way is to give, it, give you an example. Our, our limit used to be, I think, 500 watts. 
300, and we got it increased. I can actually claim to have had some effect there. We got it increased to 1,000 watts. Um, prior to that, there was a person prosecuted in Christchurch for running 1.5 kilowatts. How was he prosecuted and why was he prosecuted? Well, the answer was very simple. He was stupid enough to boast on YouTube that he was doing it. <laughs> you know, it's like, it's like the people that hold up shops and leave their, leave their ID cards behind. Um, the reality is that if, if there is an interference complaint, the radio inspectors, who are part of, of radio frequency man um, um, management, they will, they will actually go out and look at the complaint if it's, if it's serious enough. But are they out there checking every day? No, they're not. Yeah, and the second question? Ah, now, now let me answer that because it's, it's an interesting one. From the point of view of, of the radio regulations, the answer is no. The radio regulations, depending which band it is, either set a, a, um, a maximum transmitter power, PEP, peak envelope power, as you said before, or they set a, a, an EIRP power. However, that has nothing to do with the local authority and the local council, whatever you like to call it, who may, who may decide, or your neighbour may decide, they don't actually like what your aerial looks like, or it might fall over, or it's lowering the value of the, of the neighbourhood, and therefore you should not be allowed it and we will make some rules about it. So two different, two different answers to the same question. As far as the, as far as, we, we have a thing in New Zealand, the other thing that's different from Australia, by the way, is that we do not have an annual licence fee here. We have a general user radio licence, which all radio amateurs get access to once they've passed the test. We do have licence fees for repeaters and for beacons and other things that require protection, but for normal amateurs there is no, no licence fee. But there's, and the GURL says what, the, what power you're allowed to use and so on and so forth. Yeah, and the third one, last one for you. Yeah. 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 Okay. The 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 answer. I mean, uh, the answer is that first of all, nobody is out there regularly in New Zealand, at least regularly listening to the bands and measuring and trying to, because it's not possible, in fact, to, to actually measure remotely power, um, monitoring things. What happens is complaints come in, and when complaints come in, they're then, they're then prioritised and fed through the system. If it's, so it's a forensic process that would take place once that complaint has gone And if the complaint is thought to be serious enough. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. For example, if that happened to be on the same frequency as one of the one of the commercial transmitters and they made a complaint and said we are being interfered with, it might happen quite quickly. Because they're paying lots of licence fees for that. Anything to do with mobile phones? Yes. Uh, potentially, yeah. No, like really fast in Australia. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> really fast. My question sort of related to coming from the other direction. With the vast number of switch mode power supplies, yep. a huge amount of background hash on all the, all the bands, and some of it's spiky, some of it's yeah. just almost white noise. And are there's nothing we can do about it. Are there no regulations in New Zealand about that? Well, there are, re there are international regulations, but most of, the, most of the regulations regarding radiated noise or conducted noise measure the noise output from a particular unit. They don't take into account the fact that you may have, for example, lead light bulbs or um, CFD light bulbs with little inverters in them, and you may have thousands of them. Now, I'm, I can't remember the exact number, but in Auckland here, what it's, by the way, what happened downstairs with the power going out in the workshop, it, it happens in the whole of Auckland occasionally as well. And when that happened, somebody actually noticed the noise floor reduced by something like 20 dB or 30 dB. And it's something I have raised about, you know, what about the cumulative effect of, of all of these CFDs and, and lead lights and so on and so forth. But they're all approved overseas. And what power has little New Zealand got 
to persuade the manufacturers in Europe and in the States and various other places to, to make something which is less noisy if it's all right in the States, so it must be all right in the rest of the world. On imports, not on export. The other alternative would be to restrict what would be able to be used and imported. Well, that, that is done. Yes, but, but, but what I'm saying is that the standards that have been set internationally are for an individual unit, and they don't, just, they don't take into account the fact that if you have 10,000, 100,000, a million light bulbs, each with its own inverter, then the overall effect on the noise floor is to, ra rise, r is to increase it uh, a lot. Yep. Um, no, sorry. you're not allowed another one. Okay. okay. <laughs> uh, just, just really quickly, in my very primitive understanding, with the uh, square of the distance rule, uh, uh, rule in terms of propagation yeah. and, and falling off, wouldn't that mean then that the net effect of all of those individual inverters would, would be you know, a lot less because you're not measuring it you know, from the same point? If they're all in your street, no. And the, and the, prob the problem is that the rate at which it drops off depends also on the frequency. And, it, and, it's, and it's the, I, I, I suspect you're an HF operator, is that right? And at, at HF, the rate of drop off is much, much lower than it is at VHF or UHF or whatever. Okay, so, so it depends on, depends, on, depends on a whole series of, of parameters, but basically for the HF operator, it means that the noise floor has risen and will continue to rise. Um, so there's, there's not much we can do about it. I mean, we can keep asking, we can keep pushing for it, and, and maybe we'll have some of the commercial users in the HF area helping us along in that way as well. But, I mean, we, we, we get pretty good value for our license fee because we don't pay one. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I think I'd better hand over the next one.